lives. All right, good morning, everyone, and welcome back to room two. As I said before, we have with us uh, Juan Vargas. Um, he is um, actively engaged in all aspects of real estate, sales, investment, management, and construction, and he's been doing that for over 10 years. Uh, his company, Gen Wealth Capital Group, has, own, has ownership of over 1,300 units throughout Texas and Tennessee. He is also host of the Comet to Wealth podcast. So welcome, Juan, this morning. Hey, it's a pleasure to, to be on. And, uh, you know, I was here the last time, so it's a, it's a pleasure to be back. I really do appreciate it. Excellent. And also with us this morning, we have Yoshi Asano. Am I pronouncing that last name yes. correctly? All right, great. Uh, Yoshi has over 14 years of commercial real estate investment experience and has been involved in acquisitions of multifamily deals of um, 640 units valued at over, over 85 million. He is um, a licensed and active real estate professional and specialized in foreign commercial real estate investment. Um, he um, is experienced in a broad, um, I think I have a typo there, <laughs> land banking development and commercial real estate to mid to long-term investments. Does that sound about right, Yoshi? Yeah, well, thank you for the introduction. I want to be here. All right. Thanks for thanks you both for being here. And I'm going to go ahead and mute myself and turn off my camera and I'll let you guys have it. That sounds like a plan. We like it. Okay. Let's do it. So hopefully you guys can see the screen right here. Um, if you can, I guess uh, just uh, I'll see some comments if not. So we are going to be discussing the steps to increasing the NOI, right? So um, steps to increasing your bottom line as well. So this is going to be good. I like it. So a little bit about me. Um, I know that Brandon did introduce us here uh, briefly. So I was born and raised in Houston, Texas. Uh, so Texan all the way. I uh, started a multifamily with the 32 unit in 2016. Um, I'm a general partner in 650 units throughout Texas and Georgia, um, a limited partner as well, uh, in about 1,050 units as well. So uh, it's a good opportunity to, uh, to be able to learn from other operators as well. Uh, 200 plus unit under contract right now in Arizona. Um, as, as he mentioned as well, I'm a, I'm a host of the Commit to Wealth podcast, uh, and my entity is, the, is Gen Wealth Capital Group. So let me introduce myself a little bit too. Um, I uh, born and raised in Japan and moved to California back in 1996. And I got into the uh, commercial real estate investments back in 2005. It was a land banking and I've done, uh, I've, I've, I've been involved in uh, commercial renovation projects, uh, flips and stuff like that. And I moved to Texas back in 2012, specifically for multifamily investments because I like the uh, multifamily deals in Texas. Um, so I moved there seven years ago and I got into the multifamily. It's a small deal uh, by myself. And uh, back in 2015, I have done first syndication multifamily investments as a GP. That was 88 units in Fort Worth and we are selling this deal, uh, forecasting to have uh, 300 plus percent returns to the passive investors. And since then, I got involved in uh, broke. You know, I got I get into the broker business, help Japanese investor buying over fifty million dollars worth of the commercial investments, and also uh, I've been involved in as a GP or asset manager for ten multifamily deals, a to totaling of eight hundred units. That includes recent deals that we just got on a contract in Phoenix, Arizona. That's two hundred plus units. We are scheduled to close uh, in a few months here. So uh, that, that's my 10th deal and I'm currently involved in total of 90 million multifamily asset value. Okay, so we are gonna be discussing, as I said, uh, increasing your NOI. Um, but before we get there, we have here choosing the correct property manager. Oh, why do we have this? Well. Uh, in our opinion, you know, your property manager has anything and everything to do with, um, you know, impacting uh, directly your NOI. So uh, that's why we're starting here uh, with this slide first. So we want to talk about is choosing the right uh, property manager. 
And so what we mean by that is having a property manager that has experience in that same sub market that you're looking to acquire property in. So if they are in, let's say DFW, DFW is, is huge. It's Dallas Fort Worth is spread out uh, across a big, big Metro. Um, and so if you're on the North side, it's totally different, you know, managing a property there versus, you know, being on the South side. Uh, so there's a bunch of different, uh, you know, pockets, uh, that, so your property manager has to have experience, uh, managing in that, you know, in those specific sub markets. Um, so that's what we mean by that, uh, experience with the target demographics, you know, that's the other thing. So, um, you know, have experience with, you know, what the, what the, the target demographic likes, you know, what, what it is that they you know, they're looking for in a specific property in a specific unit. Um, and then, you know, you can also cater your, your business plan around that. Um, so uh, the correct asset class, and that, this is one of the most extremely important uh, pieces. Um, and it's pretty obvious, um, but I would say, you know, there's, there's different uh, asset classes out there, multifamily, residential, retail, office, storage, you can go on and on and on. Uh, but even, even within that, um, there's different classes of each one, right? So there's class A, B, C, and D. Um, so, you have to make sure that you align yourself with a property manager that has experience with your specific property. So for us, we do B and C multifamily. And I would say the majority of you listening and watching are also doing B and C multifamily properties. Um, and so therefore you're, you don't want to get, uh, you don't want to hire a class A uh, multifamily um, property manager, right? That's not, that's not your ideal manager. And even, even within that, you know, B and C are, are different as well. And I've seen, um, well, we've seen Yoshi and I have both seen um, where you know other owner, owner operators they hire like a class B um, a multifamily uh, property manager for their class C property. And now why does it matter? Or vice versa, it could be you know C managing a B or B managing a C. Why does that matter? Well, it does matter because you know they have their own. Uh, sometimes they'll have their own uh, main staff, maintenance staff, and and those guys are also doing your uh, unit turnovers and your make ready's. And so the, the C make ready is going to be totally different than, than a B make ready because you have different demographics, right? Um, and also their business plan, you know, their, their staff. And so this is, this is why we're, we're having this slide here because this is extremely important for you to align yourself with your, your property manager. Um, let's take it a step further. Um, even within multifamily, there's different, you know, sizes, you know, and we have it here as, you know, 60 unit, a 60 unit, you know, property manager is not going to be, uh, is not going to have experience, you know, managing a 200 plus unit uh, deal. So, um, you know, even between 60 to 200 and 200 plus, you know, so you have to really, you know, uh, go out there and, and find out who the, the right fit is for your specific property. I uh, like that you have the, the best results. So now you choose the property management company. So you have to manage the property manager. You have to be able to manage property manager in order to uh, be success for the uh, syndication or the, uh, you know, asset management. Um, so uh, you have to be a CEO of the company, right? Um, you have to be a leader to manage those property management companies uh, or the property management company. Um, to be a leader, it's pretty simple. There's a two main jobs that leader has to do is the uh, share your vision, right? And the share your, have your vision, have your business plan and share with them. That's the first thing you have to do. And you have to keep motivate them, right, as a leader. So those are two main things you have to do as an asset management company. And uh, good ways to do it is to uh, engage with your property managers or the on-site staffs uh, by doing the weekly or bi-weekly uh, calls, especially after takeover of the property. There's a lot of things going, right? Renovating the property, repositionings. Uh, maybe you have a higher turn to change the demographic of the community. So you have a lot of things going. So it's good to have weekly calls with them and then have the, you know, have the engagements uh, by doing that. Uh, understands what's going on with the properties, what's the challenge we have, what's the issue we have, what's the success we have. So understanding what's going on, you can, have a, you can effectively communicate with the on-site managers and on-site staff. That's how you can engage with them. And by doing that, you can continue to share your vision, continue to share your business plan so that they'll get it. And then once, you, once they get your business plan, they understand your business plan, then they're gonna help you complete your business plan. So, you know, if we get, if we get sidetracked, you know, you make sure that you bring back, to, back on the track, you know, engage with them, continue to engage with them. That's very important. If you're gonna be passive operator, passive leader, then, you know, they're gonna lose a focus.
you know, they have, they have like 10,000 to manage. So they probably focus some other property, not yours. So uh, you don't want to be, you, you, know, you, know, you don't want to be that to happen. So make sure you engage with them. Uh, they are extension of your team, right? So treat them as your own employees or even own family, you know, treat them with the respect so that they, they won't respect, they, 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 they won't forget and they're, they're gonna respect back to you, so right? So it's gonna go a long way. Uh, and uh, like I said, as a leader, you have to keep, uh, keep them motivated. Um, so uh, how you do it, you have to be excited. You have to be excited about the deal. You have to be um, excited about the project and that positive energy will influence, uh, have, will, will have the positive uh, influence to the uh, on-site staff, right? So you have to do that. And the tool to do it is, could be like offering bonuses. It could be like uh, some sort of incentive you can offer to the leasing manager for the lower, lower in the vacancy uh, or the increase in the retention ratios, uh, stuff like that, or the, uh, you know, faster turns for the maintenance guys you can incentivize all these. It was, you, you, you set the goal, you give the KPI, and if they hit the KPI goal, you, you give the incentive. Or you, say, you know, give the gift cards or some sort of gift for the special occasions, for their birthday, or the holiday season, stuff like that, just to keep engaged with them, make sure that the, you care uh, about them, all right? And then, you know, parties, uh, stuff like that. Maybe you can have like a quarterly lunch meetings or dinner meetings. Bring them off site and have a couple of drinks and just talk to them. So that's gonna father, uh, that's gonna you know give you the father relationship with them, right? So you can, you can have some sort of the personal conversation as well as the business conversation. That's gonna go a long way. And uh, choosing the property management company is very critical, like Juan said. But at the same time, having the strong on-site manager is as important as choosing the right property management company. You know, she's the one or he's the one that, uh, you know, pushing the rent, uh, you know, decrease the vacancies, increase the retentions, um, and uh, keep the place clean and safe and presentable. So having the own strong on-site manager is very important and be a leader and the lead heart or she is uh, her or him is very important for you to be success. So we're going to move on to the CapEx and adding amenities. Um, Yoshi and I both feel that this is one of the first things you should do um, when actually doing the, uh, you know, getting into and, and, you know, start to change the property and, and the feel of the property. So we always start with the, with the exterior um, because you want to give something to the tenants and prospective tenants, um, you know, to, to be excited about and, you know, to want to stay at your property and, and to bring them in. Right. So um, one of the first things we do is rebranding the feel, rebranding the name, rebranding the entire property. Right. So uh, what do we mean by rebranding? And it doesn't have to be at the very, very beginning. It can be after you do many of these different amenities and upgrades. Uh, but you can start with, you know, new signage. Right. Uh, new, new painting on the exterior. Um, you know, you know, leasing office, you know, just the new staff, you know, all that is, is rebranding. Um, and so that's, that's extremely important, especially if it's a property that has had a history of, you know, a, just a bad reputation, right? So if it has a bad reputation, that's for sure something you have to do. Um, if it's a property that has had a good reputation overall, then, you know, just, just improving upon that, then it, it should be, you know, good, right? So, um, you really have to know what the property has been like. So, so yeah, so we want to address the deferred maintenance and repairs, you know, exterior painting, you know, do those kind of things, show that you are doing some improvements. As I said, you know, uh, the, the staircases, we see a lot of those properties where the staircases are, you know, just the paint is chipping, you know, the, the exterior paint, uh, the, the roofs, you know, there's a lot of things that you can do to, to improve and add landscaping, you know, the landscaping and improved cur curb appeal. Cause how are you going to get the people in? You know, you have to have strong curb appeal, right? Um, so you want to be able to do that. So uh, improved and upgraded leasing office. That's one of the things that we're doing to our, to our latest project um, is the, the leasing office, uh, clubhouse. Um, so in, in on here also have strive to have a, a, a to strive to upgrade to a class above. So what do we mean by that? Well, if you have a seat property, you want your leasing office, your, your clubhouse, all that where people walk in 
you want that to be like a class B type of asset. If you have a class B property, you want to kind of upgrade it to, to a class A. That, that's just going to be the, the tenant's first impression when they walk into your property. So you want to give them that feel. You want to give them, uh, you want to try to close them on, on that during that visit, right? So always trying to upgrade to a higher level than what the property is, is, is what we go by, right? Um, other amenities that you, that you should add, and if you don't have already, is barbecue area, uh, pool furniture, pagolas, dark park, playground, um, you know, things that, you know, are attractive to the tenant base, the, the demographics that you are looking, um, that, you know, that you're looking for. Uh, business center, fitness center, coffee bar, you know, it, it kind of goes hand in hand with the, you know, the leasing office in the clubhouse. Um, and then you want to do community events, you know, the community events, uh, pizza, taco truck, ice, ice cream, those are just examples, but this is really what will create the community. This is really where, where people, um, you know, we, we see a lot of reviews, we see a lot of feedback, um, and it's because of the community events, right? So there's a lot of properties that can have a pergola, a barbecue area, you know, those kind of things, but the community events is kind of what brings the, your, your, your people together, your tenants together. Um, and, and that's what, you know, it's their home. So you want to make it, you want to really, really make that as, as a, as one of the priorities. Um, and, and so last but not least on this list is, you know, adding additional units. So this could be, um, this could be, you know, a slide that we, or a bullet point that we could have had on, on one of the other income, you know, slides, but we, we put it here as well, because it is, it is something that you can do for the CapEx and it can cost, you know, it's quite a bit of, of, uh, of capital up front, um, especially if you're converting some of the, some of the old storage into units, uh, but you're trying to find every single advantage that you can. Um, and that is definitely one of the, the best ways. So vacancies and unit turns, right? Uh, ways to increase the NOI is pretty simple, right? Increase the revenue or decrease the expense. So those are the two things you can do. So obviously, you know, keep the vacancy low, meaning increasing the revenues, uh, keep the unit turns uh, uh, low cost. That means uh, you're gonna reduce the expense, right? So keep vacancy low is one of the big things you can do. It's, uh, um, so uh, one of the things you can do is the retention program. So, uh, uh, you know, if you have uh, uh, the renewal, more renewal, that means you don't get the vacancy. So that's the best way to keep the vacancy low. Uh, some of the things you can do is um, just keep simply giving a gift, uh, you know, stuff like that is uh, pretty effective. Say for instance, if uh, this uh, tenants will renew 12 months lease, and uh, if they do that, you can give 42 inch TV, flat screen TV. Sounds great, right? Sounds like something valuable to them. Not really, you know, if you go to Walmart, you can pick up those TV for 200 bucks, 300 bucks nowadays. So it's very cost effective ways to do it. Or you can offer upgraded units. If uh, you have a, if you already have a upgraded units for the new tenants to come in, and this ten, you know, tenants, uh, uh, plan to leave your property because you they found nicer property down the street it's fully upgraded and they're willing to pay the market rent you can actually offer your own upgraded unit so the tenant has to the tenant doesn't have to leave um, and actually you can actually charge the transfer fee for that so you can try you know charge maybe 200 300 dollars for uh, transfer from unit one to unit B so that that could be uh, other income revenue so it's addition and you, it's not going to cost you anything because you already have a upgraded units and you budgeted for and your capex is there for the new tenants anyways so no cost to you it's, it's actually additional cost uh, for you um, and then for the tenants a couple hundred dollars is not that much because moving costs you a lot right they have to have a truck they have to have uh, you know, friends over to help out and, you know, treat them a dinner, whatever, you know, cost you more than a couple hundred dollars if they have to move to other community. So uh, a couple hundred dollars is actually cheaper for them. And now they have a, uh, well, tenants has a newer unit and, uh, you know, satisfaction is going to go up. So it's a good uh, program to have. And uh, incentive to the staff. Yeah, so, so also give the incentive to the uh, leasing managers leasing staff uh, to have the retention program or the increase the retention uh, uh, ratio. Um, and then now they can use this gift upgraded uh, units offering as a tool to keep the, keep the tenants into your property longer. So uh, retention program is actually one of the strong uh, things you can have for, to keep the vacancy low. And uh, I found a very interesting uh, study done by the, one of the syndication group 
uh, and uh, that's the cost analysis for, for the uh, unit term, right? Cost of the unit term versus the unit retention. Um, you know, you think of you think of a unit term cost you seven eight hundred dollars, right? Just uh, touch up the paints, fix the flooring, fix the appliances. Hey, it's a make ready, right? Seven hundred seven hundred bucks. Actually, not only that, um, study shows that you know you have to spend marketing to bring that pros prospective tenants into the your leasing office, and the leasing manager have to take care of the prospective tenants, um, and the vacancy loss is huge. Um, and also, you know, make ready uh, lady goes there to clean up the uh, space. That's another labor. So there's a lot of labors, vacancy loss, a lot of costs involved actually behind the scene. So study shows that cost of the unit term cost you $4,800. $4,800. That's a lot of money actually. Uh, versus the unit retention, you know, unit retention, it's, it's not going to cost you too much, you know. Um, maybe, you know, re retention program costs you a couple hundred dollars. Well, maybe you can gain some of the money if they move to the upgraded units. So if you have a property that has a 40% retention, and if you bring to the 60% retention, that's 20% increase, right? If you have 100 units property, 20% is, is 20 units. So 20 units times 4,800 dollars is actually close to hundred thousand dollars that you could possibly save having the retention program and save the cost of unit term so that's a very powerful thing so you can do to increase the NOI I mean if you take over uh, and if you are repositioning the deal or the renovating the deal you have to have a, a lot of turns to change the demographics right so that's part of the business plan but once you stabilize it you definitely want to have a retention program and reduce the uh, 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 reduce the uh, uh, retention. Uh, so the, that's the physical vacancy, and there's another, another vacancy that's economic vacancy, right? So control the bad debt. Unfortunately, if you have a bad debt, you you know you, you can't do much. You have to evict uh, as soon as possible, and you, you can have a good tenants in. So key is to have a you you, you have to have a stronger screening process in place. Right, uh, screening includes, as you know, uh, credit, credit uh, scores, uh, crime, crime reports, uh, the income, you know, income has to be three times uh, larger than your rent, stuff like that. Make sure you have a good tenants in, then they're gonna pay you so you, you don't have to back debt uh, in the future. So that's how you probably control the back debt, uh, screening the tenants. And the reduced rent concessions, that's again, you're going back to the CapEx, you have to have a competitive product to get the right uh, uh, rents, right? So the CapEx and the unit renovations is very important. So you have a right uh, upgraded units, you have a right amenity for the tenants. So you don't have to have a concessions. You, you, you know, people like it and if it's the market price, you, you're gonna get the tenants without uh, giving you, without giving away uh, the money. And also the tour, you know, just just not just not just show the units, right? You, it, it's experience that uh, uh, prospect tenant has to uh, experience. So many they walk into the leasing office instead of having like '80s vintage leasing office, you're gonna have a renovated modern uh, design, you know, uh, leasing office, and you you hear the uh, you know, soft music going on. It smells good, you know, leasing staff greeting you. That's the experience you want to give to the prospect tenants. So they're going to feel that, it, you know, that this is the community they're going to uh, live in, this is the home. Uh, and uh, once you achieve that uh, feeling and uh, give the experience to the tenants, you don't have to give you the con you know, concessions to have the uh, <clears throat> prospect tenants decide to live in your property. Um, and then have the tour route, not just show the interior upgrades, but uh, show off, show off your newly renovated fitness centers, show off your pool area, show off your community. I mean, the community area, like amenities, like a dog parks or, or uh, playgrounds, whatever you have, make sure that you have a set routes for the tour. So you show off all these places and then show the professionally staged model. Um, then you know um, they're gonna. It's it's the experience that you you wanna give uh, to reduce the concessions. So so a capex and the interior upgrades is very important. Um, and the unit turns, you wanna keep the unit turn uh, as short as possible. Uh, ideally, you wanna do it in two days. 
you know when tenants will, tenant will leave, right? You get, you get the 30 day notice. You know when they're gonna leave. So when you have the new tenants in, schedule the move in date, like three days after the move out date. So you only have a two days uh, window and then just to turn the units uh, right away. Uh, uh, you know, if you, if you don't focus on that, you know, it could be easily take a week, uh, two weeks. And imagine you have a vacant unit for two weeks or three weeks, that's huge vacancy loss, huge. That's half of the length. Um, so it's, it's not easy to do, but I know some property management is doing that. And that's some, some of the things that you have to be, uh, you have to have a leadership and train your property management to push that for that, for that. You know, it could be two days, it could be three or four days, I don't know, but don't sit, don't let it sit for like a couple of weeks. That's, that's huge loss. So now we have a raising your rents to market rates. Okay. So again, you know, we got to go back to understand what comps, you know, where your property is located, first of all, and what the comps are doing. So you want to look at really like a one to three mile radius, you know, one to three mile radius is kind of what we look for. Uh, preferably, you know, one to two, uh, something a little bit closer, a property that's equivalent, somewhat equivalent to your property. You know, and this is pretty, pretty basic, you know, I understand that, but it's, it's very important because a lot of people, you know, they just kind of skip out on this. Um, you know, you have to really understand what your comps are doing, you know, what, you know, what's the accessibility of that, that comp that you're looking at? Is it in a better location than yours? You know, is that where you're achieving, you know, better rents than you are? Is it, you know, do they have more amenities, you know, or better amenities? Is it a better, you know, a newer product, you know, what is it, you know, is it better managed? So there's a lot of different, you know, you know, key areas that you need to look at. So you can't just compare that, you know, Hey, these guys over here down the road are, are getting 200 bucks more than, than we're getting. So that's what we're going to get automatically, you know? And I think, you know, for, for a lot of newer people, um, it's, it's easy to kind of, you know, just, just assume that and, and just think that, you know, cause everybody else is getting that much, but are they really, are, do they have individual HVACs, you know, and, you know, is, is it pitch roofs? I mean, there's a lot of things that, that go involved in, into really knowing, you know, where you can be at. And, you know, the other thing I would say while we're on the same subject is that, you know, you look at the, the higher guys that are around you. I mean, you don't want to get to that level. You know, you always want to be a little bit a low, below that. So 10, you know, 10%, you know, or 15%, something like that. Um, no set exact, you know, number, but you want to be a little bit lower. You don't want to be the, the, the guy that kind of paves the road for everybody else. Um, you know, you let, let those guys do that. Right. Um, so, uh, so again, you know, look at the location, look at the levels of upgrade that you have, the amenities, the demographics and the income. And so like, for example, I live in Houston. And so in Houston, it's, it's very like pocket by pocket, right? It's sub market, sub market by sub market, uh, because th there is no zoning, you know, in, in Houston. So, um, you'll see like, you know, retail center next to an apartment complex, right. Um, or, or whatever. Right. And you see that a lot of times, but like, then you'll see like a, a mechanic shop or something like a, across the street. So, um, there's a lot of different things you got to look at, but the demographics, the income level, um, it has a lot to do with that. So, you know, just cause those guys are getting the same thing, you have the same exact kind of product that they have. Um, they're not that far away from you. Um, well, you know, the, the income level right then, right then in there in your sub market, um, within the, you know, a half mile, one mile, you know, two mile radius is, is different than what those guys are getting. So it's very, very important. So you got to make sure you do your homework and there's a lot of resources, resources out there. You can look at a co-star. Um, if you don't have co-star, here's a little trick or I wouldn't say a trick, but here's a little hint. If you don't have access to co-star, whenever you're getting, you know, your, your debt, uh, terms from your lender, you can, you can shoot over an email for, uh, to those guys and say, Hey, you know, can you give me a co-star report? Uh, for this, you know, specific property, you know, they'll, they'll be happy to shoot you over a co-star report. Uh, same thing with your property manager. They can do that for you as well uh, or your broker. So um, you should, you know, have co-star to be able to you know, see this and, and analyze, but you, you know, if you're starting out, then it's not hundred percent necessary to have it. You can, there's ways to, that you can get that done. So one of the things that we do uh, for our properties is if they are indeed below market, uh, then, you know, a good number that we strive to achieve uh, without um, any upgrades is 50 bucks. So we try to go up 50 bucks on the units, um, you know, so, the, and these are obviously, you know, the units that are month to month, 
uh, right now. So we uh, are able to renew these, you know, these folks. Again, you know, what, what Yoshi was talking about on the previous slide is reducing your, your unit turnover or your, um, your vacancies, right? So you want to reduce that as much as possible. Um, and so a lot of times if, if you're significantly lower than, you know, and you have a, a strong property management, you know, team, and um, then you can easily achieve 50 bucks, right? So, and that's one of the things that we're doing with our, our latest property as well. Uh, in Dallas. So we're, we're easily able to achieve 50 bucks. Um, and this is prior to the unit upgrades. Uh, speaking of unit upgrades, um, this again, it's, is really depending on the market. And I know this is kind of vague, uh, but you know, really, you know, 75 bucks to 200 bucks is kind of uh, the, the range that we look you know, to, uh, to achieve on those unit upgrades um, and type of upgrades that, um, that, you know, that we do are, you know, uh, vinyl plank flooring, resurfacing of the countertops, you know, cabinet fronts, lighting uh, and plumbing, fixture packages, appliances, and two-tone paint. Uh, those are, you know, some of the, the basic upgrades that we do. Um, but you can also, you know, try to, um, you know, have your business plan in place. You can have some classic units. Um, always, we, we always try to do is take some of the, the worst uh, condition property. So after you do your due diligence and you see which uh, units are, are in the worst condition, um, take some of those and maybe upgrade those to the, the, to the, the, the upgrade or maybe take it to a, another step and do like a premium upgrade. So you want to get the, the worst ones um, upgraded. It's kind of the way we do it. Um, and so some of the better ones, you know, then maybe you can do a, a lighter upgrade, right? So you've got tier one and a tier two, so to speak. Um, so, you know, this is all dependent on the market, obviously, um, and your, your demographics. So marketing, you know, ways to bring the prospect of tenants in, right? So by far, online marketing is the most uh, bang for the buck, right? Most uh, return of, you know, cost effective uh, re uh, return of investments. So first thing you have to do is to build your website for the property, right? But you don't have to build from scratch or you don't have to build, you know, by, by yourself, by own. You know, a lot of time, you know, property management company have a software, with the templates already. So all you have to do is just provide photos and contents, boom, then you have a, a website. It's a decent looking, nice looking, enough information to it. So that's good enough for your property, right? So don't spend money on making a website, but you have to have a website. You know, it's pretty simple to do. Use the templates, right? Uh, the, the software has a property, you know, real page, whatever. They, they all have templates to do the uh, <coughs> website. And uh, some of the things you can list, Rampart is a pretty powerful uh, platform that you can use. Then, you know, you just sub subscribe, subscribe and put the information in. Then they push your information to all these uh, other listing websites like apartmentfinders.com, rent.com, rent for rents.com, stuff like that. So just doing that, you, you're gonna have a lot of exposure, right? So that's good. But the one, one uh, listing that they don't push is apartments.com. So you have to in individually do it. Um, and then Zillow, Zillow and Craigslist, you know, I, I'm not big, too, too of the big fan of it, but you know, you kind of have to do it. Uh, make sure your releasing manager updates Craigslist every morning or something like that. That's going to be a routine job for her or for him so that you have a, up to date information on there, especially for the class C deals or class B deals. I don't see much in the class A deals, but the, you know, depends on the uh, type of class you have, you have to choose the right channels, right? <clears throat> And I'm not a big fan of the uh, traditional marketing. It's usually cost more than online marketings. But if you have like a large employers nearby or the large church nearby that you wanna bring a lot of uh, tenants from, then you can do uh, you know grassroots type of marketing. You know, print the flyers, bring it to the to the company, talk to you, talk to their HR. You know, let them distribute your flyers, let, let them promote your property. Um, and they probably have some sort of a special discounts for those employees or the people who attend to the, to the church or some, whatever the community connection may be. And if they're allowed, you can also give a spiff to the, uh, you know, the, the HR people or the, some, you know, people there at the school or whatever. Um, so you can do that. Um, and uh, it could be a powerful uh, marketing for you. And I, this is the, uh, the, the most uh, powerful marketing you can do is the referral program. Word of mouth is probably the best marketing you can do and the most cost effective uh, marketing you, you can have. So this is very, very, very powerful. You have to have a, a referral program. 
if you don't have that right now in your property, uh, you can give like $150, you know, $200 uh, per referral. But you know, if you have a nice community, you have not good tenants, guess what's gonna happen with the word of mouth? You're gonna attract more good tenants because they're gonna talk to their friends, they're gonna talk to their family, and they're, you know, they're good people attract good people, right? So that's a good uh, triple, triple, triple effect you can have. And you know, you know, paying $100, $150, $50 or $200 is actually nothing. If you look, do the marketing cost anal analysis and find out how much you're gonna spend per move in, you probably spend more than that uh, for the online marketing, grassroots marketing, even far more, more than that. You know, if you're gonna do direct mails and stuff like that, those are expensive. So uh, word of mouth uh, is the best marketing, right? Uh, you probably know. And the key is to follow up. So if you get the leads from the online marketing, if you get the uh, text or, or, uh, or I'm, so, I'm sorry, if you get the phone call or if you get the email from the online marketing, you got a response back in within five minutes, within five minutes. You know, you're in a fast paced society. If you wait for more than, two, more than an hour, uh, chances are they are calling or emailing to 10 different properties already. And some of the property already get back to them they already probably decide uh, to move into the different uh, property or decide to, to schedule a tour with a different property and you lose the, uh, the lead already. So speed is key. Within five minutes, uh, if not within uh, one hour, if you, if you wait for 24 hours or longer, that lead is dead. So all the, the marketing budget you spend is, is disappear. So uh, make sure you capture all, the, all these deal uh, leads with a quick response. And now you have the prospective tenants visit your property and give them a good experience, that's good. But the, again, you have to have a follow up after that too, right? So day of the visit, you're gonna text them, voice message them, doesn't have to be a formal, it's pretty, pretty, pretty casual, hey, thank you for visiting us. You know, uh, if you have any other questions, let me know, you know, type of things. And email them within 24 hours with the picture of the property, picture of the amenities, you know, offering that you offer to, to, the, to the prospect of tenants, maybe rents, maybe special, whatever the, the offer may be. So they'll remember you. You know, they probably tour four different properties and the next day, you know, they get busy doing something else. They'll easily forget your property, right? By having the picture and the email, you know, it's the ways for them to remember you. And then follow up, you know, after, after that, you maybe call, call them within a week or two, make sure you capture all these uh, prospect tenants, you know, moving to your property. So follow up is actually very, 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 very important to increase your closing ratio. So we have other income opportunities and, you know, this is where a lot of people have to, um, you know, especially in this uh, market that we're in, where it's very competitive, um, you have to be creative here. <clears throat> Excuse me, you have to be creative. So, you know, I've seen deals where if you're underwriting on the, the T12 and you're, you're looking at, you know, maybe bumping the rents a little bit, you know, what happens if the, if the, the rents are already pushed up? What happens if you can't do much there? Then you have to be creative on your other income, right? And, and it's not to say that you're, you're overpaying for the property. You're just being creative where other people are not being creative. So, you know, use that to your advantage. Right. So uh, think of things like a washer and dryer connections. Um, if, you know, you can add those washer and dryer connections, you know, uh, to the property, if you have the available space in your unit. Um, and if you don't, um, then, um, you know, if you already have them, I'm sorry, uh, rather then then you have a washer and dryer appliance package, you know, maybe. So, you know, the, the right, the ranges that we're getting, you know, is around the 30 to $50 range uh, for having those uh, washer and dryer, uh, appliances in the units. So you can, you can have those connections as well. It is going to cost you a little bit more in CapEx, you know, upfront, um, you know, they really range, um, you know, depending on the unit and depending on who does it, but you know, you're looking at anywhere from a thousand, 1500, somewhere in that range. Um, you know, if it's available to have uh, like the, the connections and have the, 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 the plumbing and the, you know, the electricity and all that good stuff, um, but it'll, it'll range. Um, again, you know, now that we're on the subject, laundry income, laundry income is a big one. So one of the properties that we actually uh, have under contract, you know, it's, it's a larger property um, and, and some of these units, well, a lot of the units are smaller, but they have one laundry facility on site 
and we looked at the income and they're like not achieving anything at all. And these units, they don't have washer and dryer connections in these units. So we can go in there and, you know, maybe add some connections if, if it was possible, but it's going to cost a lot of money, right? So what, one thing that we're going to do is, is approve, improve upon the laundry uh, facility, the laundry, um, you know, the laundry income. So one of the things also um, after doing some, some studies and some research uh, is that, you know, the, the people that go in usually not always, but the people that, that go into the, the laundry facility um, is they're, they're going to be females, right? They're going to be women uh, that are usually mothers um, or whatnot. And, and so you want to make it attractive for them. So you, you really want to put some money into that, your, your, your uh, uh, laundry facility, um, maybe, you know, do the flooring, you know, ha you know, do the walls, you know, paint and make it attractive for them and, and cozy because they're going to be spending some time there um, and, you know, have a TV there, you know, those kind of things. Because what is it going to do? There's gonna, it's going to make them uh, want to go to your, you know, your laundry facility, um, your, your uh, on-site laundry facility to be able to do their laundry, you know, and what's going to happen. They're going to spend more money, right? Um, so that's very, very important for you guys to, to look into um, and to implement. Uh, rubs, rubs is a big one. You know, everybody knows about, you know, billing back for utilities, especially if it's a, if it's an all bills paid property, you know, and so all bills paid, meaning that you're paying for the water, for, for trash, for, for electricity, for whatever. Usually um, is because the property is, is uh, like a master metered property. So it could be like a chiller or a boiler property, uh, something like that. So you can recover some of those costs that, that you as an owner, um, you know, have to take on. So you can, you know, start to build back, you know, slowly, you know, depending on the market, you know, if the market is doing it, then it's definitely something that you should, you know, look to do because it really is uh, going to reduce your expenses um, and it's just going to go straight to the bottom line. So rubs is, is a really, really, really big one. Uh, but you don't want to push it because sometimes it, that is your advantage. That's your competitive advantage. So I wouldn't say to just because you see it, that it's all bills paid property. Maybe that's why you're 98% occupied, you know? So you want to make sure that, you know, you're, you're, you're looking at the, at the advantages, the pros and cons, right? So uh, make sure that you, you, um, you know, tread carefully there. So reserved parking, this is a big one. And I've seen so many properties that don't even have this. Reserved parking is, is, is huge. All you got to do is, you know, just have a number, just go in there and, and put a little number like on the parking spot, like in, in front of, a, you know, in front of the units, like in a good spot of the property, maybe in front of the, the actual leasing office, you know, something where, it's, where they want to be at. And just, you know, put some numbers in there and then you can charge, you know, 15 or 30 bucks just for that, just because they're parking there. And it's not a covered parking because covered parking is it's totally separate. But, you know, you, you wouldn't believe, you know, how many properties that we walked that don't even have this, you know, and it's, it's just a, a good opportunity. Now, I would say you don't want to, you know, over, you know, have over ad or whatever, you know, whatever the correct word is. Uh, you don't want to have too many of them. Uh, because then, then it doesn't become something where it's, you know, valuable. You know, if everybody has one, then, then it's not valuable at all. So you want to have a certain number. So there, there's, there's a, you got to kind of have to play with that a little bit. So um, if it's a 200 unit property, I mean, I don't know, a good number could be maybe doing, you know, 30, 20, 30, you know, 40, something like that. It just, it really depends on the property, the, the location, and, and if, if the market is doing it as well. Uh, covered parking is another one. Um, you know, so, so here in Texas, you know, it's not uncommon to spend maybe a thousand or fifteen hundred, you know, something like that to, to you know, per like parking spot is it's kind of what, what it will cost to have a, a parking spot, uh, a covered parking spot for your tenants. Um, so again, you know, you have to make sure that you have, um, you know, a certain number, you know, you don't want to do too much. And I, I actually went to a property um, here in the Houston area where it was all covered parking, you know, and I was like, man, this you know, this is good, but you know, it's good for the tenants, but then as a, as an owner operator, you're thinking, well, how is it good for me? Because it's, it's not valuable anymore. You know, everybody has one, everybody has a covered parking spot. So, so then it's, it's not, I mean, I get it. Houston's hot, but like, you know, you want to make it to, to where it is, it's, um, you, you're able to, to charge a premium for that. Um, Amazon lockers or storage. Um, here's another one where, you know, obviously you you can charge for that. Um, you know, you can have a contract and, you know, have the, those Amazon lockers. Um, you know, we see this a lot with, with a lot of uh, the, the B or B plus properties. Um, but even some of the, some of the C properties where they, these, uh, that property itself is a C property, but maybe it's in, in a B type of area. Uh, you want to have those, those, that's like an, an amenity, but it's also something that you can charge. So, uh, the storage, you know, is, is, is another one. So if you have extra storage, you definitely want to take advantage of that and, and, and uh, lease it out to the tenants. Um, enclosed private patios is another really big one uh, that gets overlooked, you know, all the time. So, 
you know, every time we look, we walk a property, we're underwriting a property. We always look for that as an opportunity. Um, if it doesn't have it, and obviously you can't do this on, on the top units, you know, but we're, we're talking about the bottom units where, where maybe they have a concrete, uh, you know, slab like that's, that extends, you know, past like the building. Um, then it's like, it's, it's a no brainer. All you do is add a little covered, you know, patio, um, just a little fence around it. And, you know, boom, you know, you're, you're there, you're 50, 60, you know, 70 bucks in the Texas market. So, you know, every market is different, obviously, but, you know, you're easily able to achieve that because it gives the, the, the tenants, you know, an extra, you know, just an, an extra extension to their home, right? So they can add, you know, maybe they can have like their little kids, you know, little toys there or a little, little barbecue grill or something, it's whatever, uh, bikes, you know, just whatever. But it's a, it's a good area for them to, to kind of relax as well. That's a, that's, a, that's a big one that people don't think about. And so, um, you know, all of these are huge. Um, look for these always, always, whenever you're underwriting a property or you're looking for different competitive advantages that your, your, your competitors are not looking at at all. Uh, Wi-Fi, um, this one, we have not implemented this one yet, uh, but we, we have, however, you know, talked to our, our property manager on, on, the, on the latest deal that, we, that we've had. Um, and so there, there's a couple of different ways that you can do this is one, you can, you can have a, a company. So they're kind of like at and you know, there's a bunch of different companies, but let's just, for example, uh, use at and you know, and so they'll charge you to, you know, a, a one-time fee, you know, up front, you know, to, to go in there and to, and to, to set up the system. So go in there and add like, like different receivers into, into each one of your units. Um, and then, you know, there, there's like a, like the, the main, main, I guess, you know, uh, processor, main computer or whatever, uh, that it kind of monitors them all. And then whenever a t- your tenants come to your property, they can see, and you can offer them that, Hey, instead of going, you going out there and getting your own Wi-Fi, your own internet, we got that covered. And then, and even furthermore, you know, we, we got you covered, whichever, you know, different plan or different speed that you want, we got you covered there. So they'll charge you, you know, it'll cost, you know, hundred, 150. It just, there's, there's different ranges depending on the size of your property. Uh, but it, you know, just, uh, just for an example purpose for purposes of example, you use like a hundred grand, whatever. Um, and then you can go in there and they'll, they'll charge you uh, like it's, it's a monthly fee, right. That they charge you as well. Um, but they also warranty the, the property or I mean, warranty the, the, their, uh, their equipment as well. Um, but then you can, if, you, if they're charging you, you know, 10, 15, 20 bucks, then you can charge, turn around and charge your tenants, you know, 30 bucks, you know, you know, 40 bucks. So you're making a net of 10 to 20 bucks, you know, so you do have to account for the, for the upfront front cost on that. Um, but you know, then it's your equipment as well. And you know, they monitor it, you know, moving forward. Now the, the second way to do that is, is to, um, you you don't pay for it upfront. They go in there and install it, but it's going to cost you more, right? It's going to cost you more. Um, so it, it's a, it's a little bit different. Right. Um, and then it's, it's, um, you know, there, there's more details behind that, but I just want you guys to, to know that Wi-Fi, adding Wi-Fi, especially these days, is a huge, huge amenity. And, and it's also a way for you to also increase your other income um, and increase your NOI. So uh, pet rent, vending machines, valet, billboard, you know, all those are different ways to increase as well. Uh, if you are off of a great highway, you know, it's a lot of, you know, uh, traffic, then, you know, look to, to have like a billboard. Um, I think that's a great way to, uh, to add to um, your, your bottom line as well. Uh, vending machines, you know, I've seen people, um, you know, I saw one time, uh, we haven't done this ourselves, but I saw one time that there was an example where, um, you know, a group went out there and they added a vending machine, but, uh, their, their, their demographics was the Hispanic, uh, demographic. And so they had a vending machine and the vending machine had like, you know, cans of like peppers, you know, jalapenos or, or like, you know, just different kind of things that you can have in your vending machine. And, you know, yeah, there can be a store down the road, but, you know, instead of them, you know, getting in the car and driving, you know, three, four five minutes, they can go to the vending machine and, and um, you know, just, just get it like that. So um, I think that's, that's a great way for, for you to kind of, you know, think, you know, a little bit outside the box. Um, so it's not your traditional, you know, you know, uh, candy vending machines and chips or whatever, you know, or soda, you know, think, think a little bit outside the box and, and look at your demographics and serve them. Um, uh, last but not least on this slide is furnished units. And this is more for if you are like you're doing, you could do a short term rentals or if you're doing like studio uh, or, or like student housing. Um, so you can have them furnished. So TV, sofa, bed, uh, dishes. Um, so you can have, you know, some of those things and, you know, you can get, you know, hundred to 200 bucks. It just really depends on the market, but um, you know, that, that's another way to, to add. So if you have a, a property where it's, it's most of them are, are ones and twos and you have a, a 
a few uh, studios, then that might be something you want to do. You know, if you only have a handful of studios, then go in there and, and furnish them and then get that extra pop, you know, for that as well. Um, so, cause those might be students or something, you know, so, um, so yeah. Yeah, so the, uh, this is going to be the last, right? uh, last slide, uh, reducing the expense, right? So we're talking about the, a lot, talk about, uh, uh, about how we increase the revenue now, you know, talking about the reducing expense. Uh, one of the good big things you can do is to reduce utility, right? Utilities, payroll, insurance tax, those are the probably big four uh, ticket item in the expense lines. Uh, so, uh, you know, reducing the utility is huge. And uh, uh, you probably know Funny Man Freddie Mac has a green programs and they will require to reduce the utility by 30% in order to get the, uh, you know, uh, favorable interest rates and the terms. Um, so uh, this is a great program that you should be, you should take advantage of it if you can get the debt agency to start, um, uh, agency debt to start, I'm sorry, the agency debt to start. <clears throat> So from this year, Funny Man Fred Mac requires uh, more, more, more of the, the uh, yeah, Fred, Funny Man. So uh, you have to reduce 15% uh, of the electricity and 15% of the water, total of 30%. That's the requirements. But can you imagine if you reduce like $400,000 utility uh, cost, uh, you know, 30% of that is more than, more than $100,000. More $100, so it's a huge saving you can expect. And you can have a lower interest rate. Uh, so mortgage payments gonna go down. And if you can get the favorable term with the longer interest only period, then you're gonna, ca you're gonna further uh, reduce the mortgage payments. So your cash flow is, it's gonna impact a lot to the NOI for sure. <clears throat> so some of the things you can do for the lighting, the first thing you can do is LED lighting for the common area, right? That's kind of like no brainers. And if you want to do more, uh, especially if it's like a all bills pay the property and you have to pay the utilities, uh, change the light bulbs, change the, all the lighting uh, things in the interior to the LED as well. So you can further uh, reduce the, <clears throat> the electricity. And another thing you can do, this is not part of the green programs, but another thing you can do um, is to reduce the uh, cooling or, or heating costs, right? That's another electricity, huge electric, electricity cost is actually it's the biggest ones for the electricity is the cooling. So having, having a solar screen is a great way to do it, great ways to reduce the co uh, cooling cost. And also it's gonna give you the better carbon bill, right? So that's gonna be better, uh, you know, you can have better asset, you, you can have better carbon bill, you can have more traffic to your property and then reducing the cooling cost. And a smart thermostat like a Nest uh, can efficiently control your HVAC system. So that's gonna reduce your uh, AC, AC cost as well. For the water side, you know, it's as simple as installing an aerators, the plumbing fixtures could achieve 15% of the saving. If you have like an older property has the original fixtures in, in the units, you, and if you can find the uh, aerators that fits your uh, plumbing fixtures, that's gonna cost you only five bucks a piece. And uh, if, you, if you change all the fixtures and, and the plumbing, you know, pl that means like a, a kitchen fi fixtures of the kitchen, bathroom, uh, and the shower heads, and, and then, you know, cost you like 20 bucks total per unit. Now you save 15% of the water, that's huge. By the way, if you do the green programs, Funny May will have the uh, uh, water conservation or energy conservation study done when, when, when due diligence period, when, when during the due diligence, due diligence period, and they're gonna uh, pro provide you the reports. So you know exactly how much you can save. You change this, you, you save 6%, you change that, you save 8%, you change this, you save 12%. You just pick, pick and choose what you're gonna do and make sure that you save minimum 15%, and you can do more if you're gonna save utility, right? It depends on how much you wanna invest and how much you wanna save. Uh, stuff like that. Um, so next thing you can do for the water is the low flow toilets. Install the low flow toilets. If you have a 60s vintage and if you see the original toilets, that's huge win because those old ones have four gallons per flush or something ridiculous, right? So low flow toilets that has 1.2 gallons per flush or something like that, all of a sudden you only use quarter of the water, quarter of the water per flush. So that's huge uh, water saving. What, um, that you can achieve with the low flow toilets. 
So that's a few things that you can do for the electric and water. Um, talking about the payroll, payroll is actually an investment. If you can't retain, if you can't pay enough to retain the top talent, and if you go cheap on the payroll and have the uh, average uh, staff or uh, below average staff, that's gonna, that's 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 gonna be you're gonna have a you're gonna face a cha challenging uh, management issues. You're gonna start seeing the vacancy is gonna go up. You're gonna see that they don't push the rent. You're gonna see that they don't you know keep the clean. You keep the property clean and neat and presentable. And they all cost you because you can't get the new tenants in. You can't push the rent. You you see the higher vacancy law losses. That all cost cost you. So think about the payroll is actually investments. People, investing in the people is one of the important things in any business, right? Not only the multifamily, but any business. So make sure payroll is your investment. So try not to go uh, cut, cut, cut the corner and try to, try, don't be cheap on the payroll, right? Don't, you don't have to overspend the payroll, but you make sure you have enough payroll budget into it. Uh, so that's gonna actually save you long, long way. Um, um, and insurance, you know, uh, insurance is very expensive, especially in Texas. A lot of, uh, you know, uh, a lot of the uh, um, stuff going on in Texas, like hail damage, flooded in Texas, I mean, Houston, stuff like that. So insurance is very high. So make sure you talk to your property management uh, company or the insurance broker if they have a master policy. And uh, typically, you know, if you can join the master policy, you can reduce the premium. And another thing you can do is you can just check the line by line what kind of coverage you have you have to make sure that the coverage is actually meet the requirements of the Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac but but sometimes you have uh, over coverage items say for instance if you have like a uh, you know cost replacement uh, uh, is like say you know hundred dollars per square feet while you just need eighty five dollars uh, per square feet you know you just reduce from hundred to eighty five dollars could drastically impact it and reduce the premium. So you make sure you have the right coverage uh, line by line and it could reduce the insurance uh, premium significantly. And especially in tax, protest the tax is very important. You know, uh, tax is high in Texas, you know, 2.8, 2.8% of the property value. And also the property value is on the on the rise on the rise. So uh, every year property value is going up. That's good for you. It's a more capital gain in the future. But also you know <laughs> the tax is going up uh, at the same time. So make sure you hire attorney or or the or, or the third party agent to protest every year, right? And there's two steps for the protest, right? So first one. They're going to submit the information to the county to uh, to uh, claim that the property value is lower than what you said, and the county is going to come back to you and say, "Okay, we're going to reduce five percent, ten percent of the property value for 2019." And don't stop that. Some of the uh, third-party agent stop there, stop there, and don't go farther. Don't stop there. And there's another step you can do. You can actually sue the county and go to the court and, and uh, request uh, more reductions. And most of the time, I see additional reduction doing that. So make sure your attorney or your uh, third party agent would do the two steps all the time, every year. So that's, that's, not, that's, that's something that you have to do. Taxes, tax could kill the deal, right? So it's very important uh, to do the uh, protest. So I think that's all uh, I got uh, for the reducing expense. Yeah, and that's it. I mean, if you have any questions, you know, we are here. So I guess um, we are done with this. Um, there's our email. So uh, we are open up for uh, Q&A. All right. Thank you, guys. Uh, a lot of information there. Uh, I know our attendees enjoyed listening to that presentation. There's so much uh, to think, so many things to look at when you're trying to uh, add value, right? I mean, there's sure. organic, there's forest value add. I mean, there's so many things that you can do. Um, so you guys presented so many different options, and we do have a few questions. So I'm gonna I'm gonna run down through these. Um, so is there a calculation you use to decide on a bonus for your property manager? Who wants to take that one? Oh, Yoshi, you can, you can go. Yeah, ahead. so yeah, I, I don't have a specific calculations, uh, but uh, um, you know, it depends on the situation, right? So for the uh, retention program, 
this renewal, it could be like somewhere between 50 to $75 per renewal. And that could be shared with the, uh, you know, uh, you know, leasing managers and uh, make ready maintenance guy, uh, stuff like that. And if you want to be aggressive, you can be a little bit higher for the uh, you know, limited time, or you can just lower for the limited time, stuff like that. So uh, it could be, it's up to you, you know, you can build into your marketing budget, uh, doesn't affect to your payroll budget. Um, so um, that's, that's really up to, up to you, you know, just a rule, rule of thumb, just a regular business, you, you want to spend 1% of the revenue for the marketing, right? So within the marketing budget, you can allocate, this is, this is for the incentives, this is for the online marketings. If you want to do grassroots, uh, like uh, traditional marketing, this is for that. Uh, so you, you, you got to look at the whole marketing budget first and then find out how, how you can allocate uh, bonus to the, to the uh, staff. Yeah, and that, that uh, you know, sharing it with the leasing um, person and the maintenance. So with renewals, you want to share it with the maintenance because they had a hand in who wants to renew, whereas a new lease um, is more dependent on the leasing agent or the actual property manager. Mm -hmm. So there's a difference there. Um, do you differentiate in bonus um, levels between new leases and renewals? New leases and re renewals? On um, the bonus side. Yeah, yeah. So depends on the situation, depends on the markets. You know, if you're uh, 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 if you're renovate, you know, renovating and the reposition mode, then you know you heavy on the new leases, right? Not much on the retentions. But once you stabilize it, you focus on retention the new leases. So it depends on the uh, the property what, where you are in the cycle of the investments. You can kind of uh, uh, balance out. Excellent. That was that was a great answer to that. Um, all right, so um, I have another question. What gets you guys excited when reviewing a deal? What's, what's, you know, what's the most exciting thing for, I, I'm sure each of you has a different thing that gets you excited. So Juan, why don't you give us what you like to see and then Yoshi, you follow up after that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so actually a lot of things get us, get us excited, you know, so um, I would say one of the biggest things is obviously the, the, the market, the upside, um, so, you know, we, we always look at the market, right? So I'll kind of tell you like really quick, high level view. Uh, we always look at the market first. Um, and then second of all, um, from there, we look at the, the sub-markets, right? When determining if, if it's a property that, that we like. Um, but, but then, you know, even, even within that sub-market, what kind of asset class is it? You know, what, what is the upside? So even if you have a property that's, that, you know, at the current condition is not the best, you know, and, and you look at it and you kind of don't really feel too good about it, but like all these properties around there are, are doing awesome. And there's a lot of new development going on. You know, that's the kind of things that get me excited because I know that there's a lot of upside going into this property. Uh, this property is below, below market. Uh, but one of the things I really like specifically is when, whenever I come across a, a deal where it, it is self-managed. Um, and, you know, again, we talked so much about, you know, having a professional uh, third-party property management. Um, and whenever we come across a property that is self-managed, um, you know, that usually means, you know, one of two things, they, they, it's the owner that's managing the property or they don't have hundred percent, like, you know, good systems in place and, and they're a little bit more laid back in the way they do the processes. So, uh, you know, really when I come across something like that is, is whenever I'm like, Oh man, we need to, we need to look at this, you know, even, even more closely, uh, because there's, there's usually a lot of upside that we can you know, tap into. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all that is good. Uh, so I agree with Juan. You know, I get excited about the uh, locations, uh, the structure, condition of the property, and stuff like that. And of course, number, right? When you when you underwrite and the number walks up, I get so excited about. Uh, and if you find the upside opportunities that other investor couldn't find, and you know that's going to work, and that's going to be uh, the advantage to you. So I get very excited about that. Um, and I. I uh, gut feeling too, actually, you know, when, when you walk into the property, you feel the community, you feel, you see the structure and you, you, you just know that this is a deal, you know, if you, you know, you have, I have seen like hundreds of deals and, you know, once you find the right ones, I, it's, it's, it's more like gut feeling to me also, uh, actually <laughs> supported by all these stats and numbers and everything else, but I still, you know, trust my gut feeling also. Uh, and usually it's right. So uh, it's yeah. been working out so far. <laughs> yeah, that, it's amazing that gut feeling when you first walk on the property. I, I think it works more for the, the no answer to a deal um, than the yes answer. Because I, I do get a good feeling about some properties and then they don't work out on paper. But some you walk on, you're like, no, 
you know, I just, I just don't get the vibe. There's, you can see there's stuff I can, I need to fix. I can see it right now. It's just, there's too much going on here. It's not a great, great area. I'm not gonna be able to push rents, but that gut feeling is, is very, uh, it plays a huge factor into it. Now, yeah. obviously the numbers have to qualify. Uh, and, uh, let, me, let me add one thing really on that. And so sometimes a gut feeling um, for, for, I mean, obviously everybody's different, right? Uh, but sometimes, you know, some of the, I wouldn't say, this is not the type of product that we try to go after, but like sometimes the, like maybe the, the uglier product um, is, is actually the better one because it, it filtered out a bunch of people. And so you're going in there and uh, let me see what, what's actually the opportunity, the upside. Um, you know, okay, what if I do put in so much CapEx and then I improve the property and, and then I attract better quality tenants, then, you know, that's my upside right there. So I think, you know, it's, it's, there's a fine line you got to play there as well, because, you know, there's a lot of properties that uh, there are opportun opportunity, you know, there um, if, uh, if you just look a little bit deeper. So just, knowing what, what you're going after, right? Really. Definitely. Yeah. And I have a, another question that says, uh, you guys suggest finding the best project manager when obtaining the property. Where would one start when locating the best property manager? How do you vet the property manager to determine if they are, if they're the right one for your class of property? Yeah. So really for us, um, we, now, now we know which ones are the better, you know, managers like in the markets that, that, that we, um, that we get, go into. But one, if, if you don't, let's say you're entering a new market altogether. Um, one of the best ways is to actually contact, you know, the broker, like brokers that have specific type of listings that, that you want to go after. Uh, because those guys will know like a lot of the, the better property managers that manage those type of properties. So that's one of the ways that I've used in the past when I'm looking at a different market, I, I asked, you know, the broker, Hey, you know, I see that you have a listings or your, your previous listings have been like this, like that class B type of deals. Um, do you have any property managers that you recommend that you can recommend that, that are, that are, uh, that are great. So that's a great way that, that we use. And then even from, from there, you gotta, you know, vet them further. So um, that's, that's the way that I, that I have done in the past. I still do it. Yo, yeah. anything to add to that? Yeah, I agree. So the broker is one of the best way, you know, talk to the uh, investor fellow in, in the, in the markets, uh, syndication groups, um, ask, ask them. And, uh, also you can also, uh, find the property that you, you like, you know, same asset class, same size, you know, if you're looking for 200, uh, units in a class B neighborhood, class B deals, then look for the, the deals that you like, you know, nicely renovated, performing well, looks like performing well. It, it, it has a good community feel. Find those uh, properties and go to Postar and find the property management for that property. And you, you, you'll, find, you'll find the company too. So that's another way you can do. And you wanna, you wanna talk to, you wanna interview, you wanna interview maybe at least three or four property management companies within the niche, right? Say class B 200 units, uh, property management company within that niche, you still find two or three or four property management that does it and interview them, make sure your vision and the way you run the business is aligned with what they do. Um, so it's more like a chemistry things uh, that you, you gotta, you gotta feel comfortable with the owner of the property management companies and staff of the property management companies. So that's how, that's how we do it. Yeah. So do you, what are your thoughts on um, using the same property management company for all your your properties versus uh, having a couple of different ones to create create competition and uh, that competitive edge so they know that they have to compete against other um, yeah I, I think I think you know you know you can see it two different ways I think it, you know if you do keep it uh, with the same uh, management company, I think it, it can be good because you know how they operate, you know how, uh, how they work and you know their systems, right? So you're able to easily, you know, adapt or, or jump into a new property. Uh, however, I would say that, you know, one of my previous slides was, you know, identifying the type of property that you have. Uh, so if you're, if you find a, a good, say you find a, a great deal on, on a C property, there's a C market and a C property. Um, well, th these are, this other property manager that you've had has done nothing but bees. Um, and so they're, they're attracting the B type of tenants. Um, I, I would, you know, you can look into those guys, the same guys, but then, you know, maybe a C, C manager will be a better fit for that C property, you know? So we, we try to, you know, look at both, um, you know, just depending on, on, you know, the type of asset classes that it is and, and, you know, pretty much in the, the market that it's in. Yeah. So if, if he walks out with this property management and you're happy with it, you, you stick with it. Right. But if you don't, then you have to look for another ones. So, uh, you know, if it works out good for you, you know, a lot of syndication groups uh, let them manage 10, 20, you know, deals, right? In the same sub-markets. 
uh, or if it doesn't work out, then you're going to start test, start to use the other property management company so that it's going to create the competitions and maybe the, the current management company will perform better. But by using one of, you know, one of the property, let the, let the other property management manage one of your property and they, they start to see the, uh, the see what's going on and, and try to refocus your property again. So uh, I, I think it's that it depends on the situation, but a perf perfect scenario, I want to stick with one property management for the one type, one class asset. Yeah. Right? One company for class B, one company for class C and, and do that. That's going to be pretty, it's going to reduce your time that you're going to spend, it's going to reduce your expense you're going to spend. You know, I, I think it's going to streamline if you can do that. So that's the goal. Yeah, and I think uh, sometimes though, when you're let, let's let's use a contractor analogy. Let's say you're you're looking for a contractor and you have a budget set, and and they come in and they they're at your budget number, they're performing the work right, mm -hmm. and so you're like, yes, good, let's get them signed up, and they're doing the work correctly. But then you somebody just contacts you out of the blue and they give you a price, and then you start researching and find out that even though their price hit the market or your budget you're you're paying way more than market and so you didn't know that until you shopped it right so it's it's sometimes like if because you, you made the statement that if it works out why switch but sometimes even though it's going well you don't know what you're missing out on until you actually go out there so and whereas you want to the best case scenario you want to keep the same property manager but you always want to be looking you know and just seeing am i missing out on something are they in the market range for yeah. price yeah, absolutely. You always shop, right? Always shop the markets, make sure you're, you're getting the right price, right? Uh, so uh, one of the keys is to talk to your syndication, uh, syndicator uh, uh, um, friends and, you know, just, just have the uh, communication, conversation, you know, information exchange, make sure you're, you understand what's going on, you know, you understand uh, what's the trend, you, you understand what's the rates, uh, today's rates. Um, that's, that's very important, yeah, for sure. Definitely. Well, we have uh, just two minutes left. Any uh, closing remarks that um, you both would like to give to our attendees today? Um, I, I just want to say, you know, um, I want to thank you and I want to thank everybody uh, for, for, you know, sticking with us for what is it, a little over an hour. Um, yeah. So I know it's a Saturday morning and or, well, Saturday morning here in Texas, but um, I know it's a Saturday and you guys can be doing something else. So I really do appreciate everybody's time uh, to be here and I look forward to uh, uh, future events, you know, so that'd be great. Yes, yeah, and here, well, I appreciate your time to listen to us, you know, hopefully you, you pick up here and there, uh, you know, hopefully you have a valuable information from us. Um, and uh, hey, you, you, thank you for hosting the, the events, appreciate it, and the honor yeah. to be as a speaker. Um, and, uh, you know, good luck for all you're doing, and you guys are great, so you, you guys are doing great, so uh, uh, looking forward to uh, uh, speaking with next events. All right, Yoshi and Juan, thanks again for being here, and, and have a great rest of the day. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, everyone. I have to make a change here. Um, all right. I clicked the wrong button there. So uh, thanks for joining us again for that session. Great job talking to Yoshi and Juan. So I appreciate all their insight. That was great, um, great advice. Um, you know, if, when you're in the business and you hear somebody saying some of the things, you're like, oh, yeah, yeah, I know what they're talking about there. So um, if, you, if you're looking to get into this, that was great advice um, from Yoshi and Juan. So uh, please uh, come back and join us for our next session. Let me pull up our schedule here um, so I can Go through. We're going to have a little bit of a break right now from uh, 1215 to 1230, but join us back again at 1230. Uh, in room one, we're going to have a panel discussion. Those are great. Evan Holiday, John Kasman, Whitney Sewell, and Jason Yerusi. So, and Whitney Sewell, so if you've been following us this morning, you have seen that we're doing a fundraiser uh, this morning for Whitney uh, to raise funds uh, for adoption. So um, I just posted the link in the chat box. Please go to that. We have two thousand uh, dollar match um, contributions right now. Uh, doing great on that. But if you want to see Whitney and hear Whitney, uh, he'll be on the panel discussion at 12:30 in room one. In room two, we'll have the nuts and bolts to finding distressed notes with Scott Carson. So please join us back here in this room for that with Scott Carson. 
Um, and in room three, women in multifamily real estate, the challenges of what we bring to the table uh, with Krista Testani. Krista, if you're in this room, um, you just, uh, you heard uh, Chris start us off this morning. So Krista is his uh, business partner there. So be sure to check that out. And um, don't forget to sign up for the next summit at nextmfin.com and go to the podcast and post a review. Send a screenshot to Stacy at multifamilyinvestornation.com. We will see you back here at uh, 1230. Thank you so much.